<laughs> I'm just hoping I figure out which direction that plug's going when I look down. No, it is a joy to be here this morning, and I am so thankful, and I know I speak for my family as well, to be at Compress Branch. Brother Richard, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the accommodations. I'm thankful that we get to experience the uniqueness of the Christian experience this week because some of my best friends are here that I only have opportunity to see a couple of times a year. And so I rejoice in these moments. And I want to not only rejoice, but I want to receive in these moments for the days ahead because... We need this oasis. We need these moments. These moments will soon become memories that we'll need in the days ahead. John chapter number 6 is my text this morning. And I would invite you to turn with me to John 9 and verse number 1. John Chapter 9 and verse 1. Would you stand to reverence the reading of the Word of God this morning? These are the words of the Lord. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sin. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. When God gets a hold of a person, people can't hardly recognize them. They're different. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. You can be seated. The Gospel of John is written to show that Jesus is the Son of God. At this point, (laughs) we look back and recognize that Jesus has turned water into wine. He healed the official son. He healed the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. He fed over 5,000 people. And he walked on the water, causing the disciples' little ship to cross the sea in gale force winds. And now, Jesus will heal a man who's born blind. Looking at these sign miracles in the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John, I think it would indicate that omnipotence and impossibility don't mix. Obstacles are nothing but opportunities for our God. So one of the beauties of this passage is 
is the multifaceted ways we can look at this text. We, we can look at this as the sixth of seven miracles in John's gospel. We see the, the seven miraculous signs. We, we know the seven I am statements. We recognize that the number seven is very important in the gospel of John. But we could pull it out of its context and, and see it as a standalone story in redemptive history. Because it's interestingly ordered, isn't it? First you have a miracle. And then you have Jesus disappearing only to come back at the end. While with all of this happening in the middle of this scene, there's conversations being had by various people. We could look this morning at the conversation between the neighbors and the man born blind. We could, we could look at the conversation between the Pharisees and the man born blind. We could see the conversation between the Jews and this man's parents. They drug his poor mama into this. And at the end, we see this Jewish crowd that has surrounded this scene as spectators. They had much to say, and we could consider that this morning. We could consider this morning a few headings concerning this text. We, we could look at the theme of faith or unbelief or a changed life. But for our time this morning, I want to narrow our focus because I know time is fleeting. One phrase tells the tale. Verse number 3, here it is. But that the works of God should be made manifest. In him. This happens on the heels of a very dangerous moment in the life of the Lord Jesus. If you go back to John chapter number 8, verse 56 through 59, show us that because Jesus was willing to reveal himself as the I am, the Pharisees, the religious elite, took up stones to, to, to stone him. And I think it's not by coincidence. Jesus is leaving the temple where they're seeking to stone him in the courtyard only to find a man who was born blind, caught in providence. <laughs> Jesus goes from those who are blind spiritually to a man who is blind physically. And he recognizes this man but this man had never seen anything like Jesus. Amen. Jesus goes into the very heart of enemy territory, at the very height of, of danger personally, and he displays a calm and a grace in this moment. He's demonstrating for us and for those who were watching his deity, his power, his absolute sovereignty over all of this. He's not shaken. He's not worried. But he uses this obstacle as an opportunity. Amen. Because omnipotence, and impossibility don't mix. Briefly this morning, I want us to see three headings. If I could be like Alexander McLaren and hit this text and it fall into three perfect pieces, I would be grateful. But unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm not worthy to even lace Alexander McLaren's shoes. But I do want to say this. There's a question posed. Here's the question the disciples ask. And I think this is a question that is commonly asked. I'm going to put it in our vernacular. Maybe you've even asked this question. Why do bad things happen to some people and good things happen to other people? Now, you may not be wrestling with that this morning, but I'm sure there's been a time in your life when you've asked that question. Yes, sir. We ask that question because we've inherited this thought that bad things only happen to bad people and good things only happen to good people. That's the default religion that we have inherited. Many this morning... See, heaven and hell is getting what one deserves. And many even look around in this life and they think that good people get good things and bad people get bad things. You hear it just like I hear it. 
On every plane, we hear that if you work hard, if you do good, if you achieve much, you'll have the best in life. Be what you want to be. Now, we shake our heads at that, but even spiritual people will suggest that life operates this way. Do you remember Job's so-called friends? They wanted him to repent, didn't they? Confess your wickedness before God because the upright, they're not cut off before God. Surely you've done something wrong. That's the position these disciples have taken when they see this man who's in need. Instead of seeing an opportunity to care for him, they want to quandary some theological question as they sip on their lattes watching this man struggle. If we would spend more time caring than coming up with various quandaries, people would get genuine help and we wouldn't be so confused all the time. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? I mean, this man was blind. And they're seeing this as a punishment for these parents. Isn't that how the devil often works? Yes, sir, brother. I mean, do you see this in your life? That's what the devil says. He'll say, that's your fault. Yeah. Who did sin? Yeah. Who caused this man to be born blind? That's the question. Common question. Unexpected answer. Yeah. Here's the answer provided. Verse number three. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. Now that's not to say, and I hope that we back up from this and recognize that they were not operating in sinless perfection. And to be sure, there are multiple scriptures that link personal sin and personal suffering. It's not that this link is, is never present. We know that from Scripture. Adam and Eve, Miriam's revolt, Korah's rebellion. We, we know that Nahab and Abihu's strange fire. 1 Corinthians 11, we read that there are some who are sick and some who've even died because they did not obey God's command in the receiving of the elements of the Lord's table. There's plenty of examples of Reaping what you sow because we know that you can't sow wild oats and pray for crop failure. Hello, somebody. But this link isn't always absolute. And the greatest example of this is Jesus Christ himself. This man knew no sin. And yet he became sin. He was made sin for us. Have you considered the wondrous cross this morning? <laughs> no, we've considered our temperament <laughs> and our upbringing and our makeup that causes us to feel as though even as believers, children of the Most High God, that we failed Him. When we read in Scripture that there is there now for no condemnation, we don't believe it. Because we look at our job and we look at our health and we look at our family and we say, this must be because of something we've done. I recognize this morning we're depraved. <laughs> we're wicked, putrid, filthy, rotten sinners. I've heard Brother Richard say this several times and I stole it. He'll say, I've looked across congregations and I haven't found a good person yet. I'll pay you royalties, Brother Richard, the next time I use that phrase. But it's true. And yet the unnecessary roughness comes when we see life as this overly moralistic, mechanical way of, of thinking. On Monday, I'm obedient, so on Thursday, I get blessing. Right. On Friday, I've sinned, so on Saturday, on Saturday, I'll only get cursings. Yeah. You know how proud that is? You know how much stinking pride is in that kind of thinking? Adrian Rogers would have called that stinking thinking, wouldn't he? 
Because we, we live as though everything that's negative and positive is based upon what we've done. But Jesus is saying, I've got a greater work. A greater plan. And we see that here in this man's life. You know, there's things that Jesus could have said. Why was this man born blind? Well, we live in a fallen world. And that's true, isn't it? But there may not always be a a personal connection. There is always a cosmic connection. But, but Jesus doesn't answer the question that is posed by the disciples that way. Let me ask you this. How do you answer this question? How do I answer this question? Because if I'm honest, I may not answer this question like Jesus did. Here's how some answer it. When this question's asked, they'll say, well, there's no reason at all. It's nothing but chance. You know, stuff happens. That's what people think. And then most of the time when a question like this is raised, we go exclusively into a physical direction. We, we speak scientifically. We, we speak biologically. We, if we're not careful, we'll think there's some type of physiological material answer for everything. But even if there is a biological answer, we may be missing the most important answer of all. How does Jesus answer it? Here's the anchor point. Not just for the sermon, but for our lives. Verse number three, a little purpose clause. (laughs) In order that. It's not that this man sinned. It's not that his parents sinned. If you think it's that, then you're going in the wrong direction. It's in order that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Yes, there may be a biological explanation. Yes, suffering may be connected to the cosmic matters of the fall. But Jesus wants his disciples to understand that this man was born blind because God has a plan. I don't know what you're facing this morning. God has a plan. I don't know what you're going through today, but God has a plan. You may not fully understand it, but I've got good news, sir. God has a plan. (laughs) This is not God simply responding to something. No, he isn't merely making lemonade out of lemons. (laughs) It says, in order that... God has a plan. In 1995, a nonprofit organization called the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation was created. By 2004, this foundation grew so large that every year in the United States on February the 17th, we celebrate the Random Acts of Kindness Day. I've seen those pictures, you've seen those videos, maybe. Maybe you even adhere to that holiday, if you could call it such, where you hold somebody's door for them, purchase them a cup of coffee. You know, a random act of kindness. That's not what this is. (laughs) This isn't a random act of kindness. This is not a loose turn of events. Remember when Jacob died? His brothers were worried about Joseph. The brothers of Joseph were worried about him because they thought he was going to let them starve. But as for you, <laughs> you thought evil against me. But God meant it. That doesn't mean he shaped it or turned it or used it. (laughs) But it started out that way. For the good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. You see, God knew what he was doing. But he was preparing Joseph. 
from the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison to the palace. God meant every step. He orders the steps of righteous men. He meant every step for good. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. <laughs> I love this. You look at verse number 11 and you look at verse 25 and you'll discover that this blind man didn't know much about Jesus. He didn't know much about him. Verse 25 said, and he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I don't even know. But one thing I do know. <laughs> I didn't know much about him. And I'm fairly certain you didn't either. Because these things are spiritually discerned. <laughs> you didn't know much about him. I didn't know much about him. But this man knew that God, when he passed by his way, it wasn't an accident. But he did for him what no man could do. He said, I once was blind. But now I see. Sign miracle, isn't it? To point people to the sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is our Savior and Lord? In our text, Jesus goes on to speak about how he's the light. And how darkness will come upon them. And he goes on to say that he's literally the light for this man and the light for all who will receive him. But there's coming a day. There are those who refuse. And their eyes won't be open. What a privilege this poor man in pain experienced. I once was blind. But now I see the light shined in its darkness. If you're interested this morning in your ancestry, one of the one of the one of the companies that you're going to reach out to is 23andMe. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, they'll send you once you pay them a handsome amount of money, a little collection basin and a swab. Because what they're doing is, is, is sending out to collect your saliva. I'm sure you know this. I'm not saying something you don't know. But they can tell a lot about you and what they receive when they swab your mouth. Your DNA is in that saliva. Why do I bring that up? Because I'm receiving royalties from 23andMe. No, that's not it. Don't you see Jesus here? He's the light. He's the life. And he is putting his life in the point of this man's deepest darkness. He spit on the ground. He made clay of the spittle. Genesis 2, 7. Isn't this a beautiful recreation? of Jesus kneeling down and taking the dust of the earth. Where he created the first Adam, we see the second Adam recreating, foreshadowing the mission of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This man goes to where he's sent. He's had mud rubbed in his eyes. He's been blind his whole life. A strange rabbi, he spits on the ground, he makes a mud pie, he smears it all over him, he goes to the pool of Siloam, and how does he get there? He can't see yet. Scripture says he was led. He was led. Jesus, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. Sometimes God uses what we would see as unfortunate circumstances to get us exactly where he wants us to be. So can I close with this today? We see the question posed, the, the answer provided.
But I want to remind you this morning there's purpose in your pain. There may be someone who's saying this morning, that's, that's wonderful for the man who was born blind. <laughs> I mean, we can see God's power was, was displayed in him because this miracle occurred. I mean, the Lord healed him. He was born blind. And, and preacher, I agree, God must have had a plan because this blind man began to see. But what about me? Just like this blind man. You and I can be a sign pointing to the sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus. You see, you may think that you've been shortchanged by God, but if you've been born from above, you are a recipient of the same power that was present on this day. Say, do you believe that? I sure do. Because if you've gone from darkness to life, if you were dead in your trespasses and sins and alive together with Christ, your life is a very miracle. Sir, ma'am, if you are staying faithful in suffering, your life is a miracle. If God is working in you right now, that's a miracle, an undeserved grace, and we should rejoice regardless of what we're facing. Each one of us, each one of us a walking miracle, pointing to the sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ. Verse 3, he doesn't say this, but that. The word this and the word that are demonstrative pronouns which are used to indicate something. I'm sure you wanted an English lesson this morning from somebody who speaks broken English. Hello, somebody. But we use the word this to point out a noun that's close to us. We use the word that to point to something that's further away from us. The emphasis is not on this. But on that. <laughs> that he would be made known. Your immediate circumstance, that's not what your focus should be on. In fact, this tabernacle is temporary, isn't it? But where we're laying up treasures is forever. You may not know what he's doing this morning, but don't worry about this. <laughs> worry about that, because further along you'll understand it. Further along, just keep on pressing on. Maybe it's to make his strength perfect in your weakness. John Stallings had it right, didn't he? The hymn writer, the preacher, the evangelist, he said, I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. <laughs> and when you do, he said, I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean. Learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'm not against breaks. I know people need vacations. And I'm sure that there's some sitting here this morning who have captivating stories of things that happened this year when you had an opportunity to take some time away. But I'm convinced at the end of life's way, you'll look back on your life and you'll think of those times when you really grew. Where God showed you what you would not have known the character, the compassion, the contentment of Christ. Only because he put you through something. Difficult days, trials, dare I say even suffering. You know God works all things. All things. According to the counsel of his own will. And so I want to leave you with this. I'm not sure if I'm plugged in or unplugged. But Bill Fray, the 
the bishop in the Episcopal Church who served in the, the early 1950s in the Colorado area. He was asked by the University of Colorado to come in and mentor and, and coach those who were underprivileged. And so he did. Little did he know there would be a man by the name of John, a young man who was a college student at the University of Colorado who would change his life. He got the call about young John. John was blind. And so he needed someone to, to read for him and, and, and walk him through what took place in class because there were things that he could not see or understand because of his disability. For about a month, they worked together. And at the end of that month, Bill Frey thought it right to to finally pop the question. John, what happened? And the young man began to give him a detailed account of a very tragic event that left him blind. But he said worse than the tragic event was the aftermath. I, I grew angry and bitter and cold. I was so mad, I wanted to die. I would sit in my room only to come out when it was time to eat because it was as if my life had been taken from me. I could no longer see. Bill looked at John and said, Well, what happened, John? You're one of the most popular people on campus. You have scores of friends. Everybody loves you. You seem so vibrant and happy. It's been such a joy to work alongside of you. What happened? He said, one day my daddy walked in the room when I was laying on my bed, bitter and angry, and he said, son, it's time for you to get up. Winter's coming, and the storm windows have got to be put in their proper place. His daddy walked out without any more explanation. And I'm sure you can probably hear young John muttering under his breath with the audacity of my dad. He knows my condition. But that was the motivation he needed, Brother Richard. To stumble into the garage, fumble and feel around to find the ladder and the storm windows. The whole time he's, he's trying to make his way up the ladder, put the storm window in, he's angry. The story says that he was cussing mad. That was the phrase. Surely nobody's ever been there before. Never. He said until he realized that he had just put the last storm window in. And he come down the ladder. He said, I can't believe. And as soon as he said that, he turned and he bumped into his dad. You see, here's what happened. His daddy never left him. In fact, he was there all along. You know what that tells me? We need to be more interested in that than in this. We may not see it all, hear it all, or know it all. But I'm thankful I serve the one who does. Because omnipotence and impossibility.